Hi, everyone. Welcome to Practical Talks for Family Docs, brought to you by the College of Family Physicians of Canada. It's our live uh, clinical webinar series. I'm Mike Allen. I'm a family doc, and I'm the Director of Practice Support at the National College. I'll be both the host and the speaker for today, playing both roles. I'm dressed strategically in my Steve Jobs uniform because I'm going to be selling a... Um, a uh, electronic product so keep that in mind that was the cfpc learn but we'll talk about it at the end a little bit um i'm also an adjunct professor at the university um, of alberta um before we get going what i want to do is do the um uh, traditional lands reading so we acknowledge that the lands that we are hosting this meeting on include the traditional territories of many nations the CFPC recognizes the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada, and that continues to affect their health and well-being. The CFPC respects that Indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite all attendees to reflect on the territories that they're calling in from as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship, and contributing to reconciliation. Thanks for that. And many of you may need to think a little bit about where you're actually, where you're uh, calling in from, where you're watching from, because uh, the lands, of course, vary. We, we, in this statement, we make it more generic because we're from all across Canada. Um, in uh, another housekeeping issue is where you're watching from. And if you're watching from YouTube, which by far the majority will be watching from, um, it's important for you if you want to add uh, comments or discussion pieces, to um, that can be done in the window to the side. You just need to make sure that you've signed into your Google or YouTube account. If you can't see that um, comment section, then you just need to switch to, um, you're probably in full screen mode, so you need to switch out of that. Uh, it's important to know that we'll be using those questions uh, as we proceed. Um, we won't get to them until the end, but there will be plenty of time for me to review them. And we have a team that's kind of capturing them for us. Uh, lastly, is if you're watching this as a live um, presentation, then you can claim it for credits. And um, what you do is you'll see in the chat window towards the end of the presentation, um, there'll be a link for you to click on and answer a survey. And if you've answered the survey by the end of uh, the week, uh, you'll have a, a main pro credit entered directly into your account. Okay, that catches us up. So now I'm going to um, share my screen and we'll start with um, looking at our presentation together and going through it. Um, now I'm just unsure if we're sharing. So it's not showing that I'm sharing. Sorry about that. Let me just. Um, Brian, could you come on for a sec? Because I can't see it as sharing. Just one sec. Yep, it's just uh, hit the share button at the bottom. Yeah, it could uh, okay. it didn't show the application. So I'm going to try again. I think we'll be fine this time. Okay. I apologize at home, guys. For some reason, it's not. It wasn't working the first time. There it is. Here we go. Apologies. There you go. All right. Okay. Sorry about the slight delay. Um, that's who I am, and that's the topic. We also call this topic um, what's new, what's true, what's poo, and we'll explain a little bit why we call it that in just a second when we review the objectives. So um, who am I and my conflicts of interest? So um, I get uh, funding personally who pays for me is the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And uh, I used to be an employee of the University of Alberta, that's still within the last two years. And I was paid um, to do clinical work um, as a rural locum. And I've received research and speaking fees from a variety of sources, including, um, you see the list there, they're virtually all things like um, medical associations, uh, university uh, CPD departments, chapters of the Colleges of Family Physicians of Canada, departments of family medicine, all of that kind of thing. They're all kind of nonprofit organizations and I haven't taken any funding from industry. Okay. Now our learning objectives are 
and they kind of speak to this whole what's new, what's true, what's poo. And that is, we're going to look first at the things that are truly new, um, that we haven't uh, we haven't really seen before, but are quite innovative um, ideas that we might want to implement in practice. Then after that, we want to look at the things that we've been doing for a while, but we finally got good evidence that confirms what we're doing or reaffirms it, and we call that what's true. And then the last thing are the the tests and therapies that got a lot of either interest in the media or um, for other causes uh, we need to reconsider um, what we're doing and that's the kind of what's poo. So when you think about that, um, uh, here's some examples of what's new. This is, uh, this is an invention for golfers, obviously. I don't think you're gonna be using this kind of thing in the street or anything like that or on the, on the soccer pitch, but this is called the Euro Club and it's all in the name. So if you're out on the golf course and you have no access to a place to go to the washroom and you're male, I don't think this works as well for females, you can actually pee into this, um, uh, urinate into this club, which has a hollow chamber in it. And you can see it comes with a discretionary towel. I personally cannot believe some of the things that are invented, but this is a true invention and you can order it, the Euro Club. Okay, what's true? And this is one of those times where all you need is the title. Stabbing disrupts class on anger management. <laughs> Don't think you need to say anything else. And then the last is what's poo. So this is at the Quality Inn and they ran out of letters. So you can get um, extended stays, uh, a hot breakfast and a heated indoor poo. And you can reflect on the whole where poo should be um, it, and, and all of that kind of thing, but generally indoors is probably better. Okay, let's get to our actual topics. And um, this actually speaks to something you're going to get uh, in a larger session coming up down the road with our clinical evidence experts at the National College and the peer group. And they're gonna review a lot of uh, the diet research um, and, and weight loss research. But for this one, this, was from, this study was from this year and I wanted to lay the groundwork on intermittent fasting because the Tools for Practice was written on this in 2019. And intermittent fasting comes in all sorts of flavors. So in this case, what they did is the majority were kind of fasting on certain days um, versus uh, certain times of the day. So what they did is they reduced to the caloric intake to 500 kilocalories or 500 calories uh, uh, per day for two days a week versus continuous, which still had calorie restrictions. And like many of these diet interventions that compare two diets, um, the weight loss was very, very similar. It was between five and nine kilograms of weight loss over six to 12 months. So no real difference between the types. Um, and we'll talk about how we Im implement this because it's, it's, it's actually a lot easier than it seems when it comes to diet research. There's 12 week, this was a 12 week pragmatic RCT, this new one from 2020. And it had 116 overweight or obese people. And you can see 60% um, were male, which is good because in a lot of these research studies, um, obviously obesity affects both genders, but um, women are generally more interested in participating in research studies. So this was interesting because it was more men. And they use consistent meal times of three structured meals per day with snacks, or they use time restricted eating where you only ate between noon and eight o'clock. So really that allowed you to have lunch and dinner and try to avoid the evening snacks, which is obviously a big concern for people. And they both receive slightly different messaging. So the consistent mealtime group might receive things like fruits and veggies are good for you. And the other group might receive or, or, or received um, notices when it was okay to eat. And what was the difference between the two groups overall? Well, the time restricted group at the end of this three month period lost one kilogram and the continuous mealtime group lost 0.7. And there was no statistical difference and likely no meaningful difference. That's not even a full pound. But what we're getting in this research now is actually far more helpful and, and, and uh, can allow us to implement the information around diet research. And that's things like this. This is an ugly scatter plot. And they're hard to interpret I, when you look at this and say, well, what the heck does that mean? But but what I want to tell you is those little dots indicate individual people. And what it shows you is that regardless of the diet choice, people are losing as much as 10 kilograms 
or gaining as much as five kilograms in both groups. And the variance between them is obviously 15 kilograms for individuals within each diet type, but the, but the actual difference between the sum groups you can see was only 0.3. What this really means is between individuals, the importance of the difference between individuals in diets is about 50 times stronger than the type of diet. So there's real good take home message here. Variability in individual responses to diet is so great, it's way larger than the response to the type of diet. So whatever is working for patients, tell them that is good for them. If they ask you what the best diet is, we don't really know. We know that you have to cut calories, but whatever style or fad of diet you're picking is probably the good one for you if it's working. Now, uh, on to diabetes. So diabetes is a huge issue in primary care. It's one of the top three in most uh, research studies of what people are coming in from, particular in for, particularly in um, uh, developed countries. So this, there were two huge reviews of this. One umbrella review looked at 36 other systematic reviews and new RCTs, and the next one looked just at RCTs, and you can see 450 of them. Generally, they covered 21 drugs over nine classes, and um, compared them. And they did a network meta-analysis, which is a bit tricky, actually. It can exaggerate differences um, between things because they're not comparing, they're comparing A to B and B to C and then saying, how does A affect C? So we don't, it's a bit of a stretch, but still the information here is good and it, it does agree between the two, even the one that did the network and the one that didn't. What is found is that the SGLT2s and the GLP1s and probably metformin reduce cardiovascular disease and death. Now, they do it slightly better the higher risk you are and they do um, certain ones better than others. So SGLT2s do better in heart failure and GLP1s seem to do better in stroke. But overall, if you looked at them, they're generally reducing the bad outcomes that are more common in patients with heart failure, and that is cardiovascular, sorry, in, in diabetes, patients with diabetes, and that is um, cardiovascular disease and death. But what they also point out is the things that don't really work. So DPP-4s and acarbose really don't do anything for, um, except change sugars, um, that's what they do. Um, and DPP-4s, I know that comes as a shock because we've studied tens of thousands of people, but there's really no evidence that they reduce outcomes that um, really matter. Uh, what about sulfonylureas and insulins? Well, they don't reduce outcomes that really matter either. And if anything, uh, sulfonylureas may increase things. There's suggestion of retinopathy. And in one study, they showed an increase in um, cardiovascular events. So really, we're using them for sugar control. That's what we're using them for. And because they're really good at sugar control, particularly insulin, obviously, um, they can increase hypoglycemia more than some of the others. Then there's mix like pioglitazone. There's some that show that it might do something for one or two or a cardiovascular disease outcome combined, but others found not or that there were harms like heart failure and things like that. So generally another one that to not jump at, um, unfortunately. So really what we're left with is the sad news, but many of you already knew this news, that metformin is still the first line and that if you're looking at reducing outcomes that matter in patients, it's SGLT2s and GLP1s. Um, they're the ones that do it. And unfortunately, they're costly, those last two. That's their biggest problem is their expense and GLP1s more so than the SGLT2s, um, about twice as much as those. Now, this is an interesting one, and, and there will be something that limits implementation here, and we'll get to that at the end. But this is the um, uh, medicine Reflumalast, which was used for uh, COPD as an oral medicine to help control COPD, which it works marginally well in, in advanced um, cases, but it does provide some benefit. Um, so, but could it be useful for things like psoriasis? Um, and so what they did is they studied 331 people and they were given reflumalast cream 0 0.3, 0 0.15, and placebo. Um, it's a vehicle cream once a day for uh, 12 weeks. The mean age of these patients was 54, 55% were male, so almost 50, 50. And their psoriasis affected 6.4% of their bodies. Their PASI score, which is a psoriasis score, was at eight out of zero to 72, where 72 is worse, the higher end is worse. 
And that means that these guys were kind of in the mild to moderate range of um, psoriasis. They called it moderate psoriasis plaques, but the PASI score indicates kind of a mild to moderate area. What happens? So if you look at the 0 0.3, 0 0.15, and then placebo, you can see that um, to get to clear or almost clear at six weeks, 28%, um, because that's where they looked at most outcomes. It was actually planned for, but they followed them for 12, but they looked at six weeks, it was 28% versus 23 versus eight. So that means the 0.3 was 20% uh, better, um, absolutely, and Riflumalask was about, or sorry, and the Riflumalask 0.15 was about 15% absolute better. All the other outcomes were similar. Um, when they looked at cut points, they were about 15 to 20% better than the vehicle cream for absolute benefit. If you looked at the change in score, um, so this is the percent how much the score got better. So you can see the scores were about 50% better with the um, 0.3 and 0.15. So that means their PASI score went from around an eight down to around a four. And the placebo uh, scores went from about eight down to a seven. Uh, adverse events were very similar actually across the board and they couldn't, uh, there was nothing statistically significant there. So reflumalast appears to work relatively well uh, from mild to moderate psoriasis over small areas, but it is costly. So here's the limit. This is a new thing, um, but unfortunately it's very expensive. So I don't think most of us will be using it very often. I did a, we found, uh, Tina Kronik helped me and found the cost of this. It's around $150 for 60 grams. That's a small um, little jar. So that would be something around this size of jar. Um, and that would, over the 12 week period, would cost $600. So if you look at the six week outcomes, it would cost $300 is the calculation that I did of how much cream I would need to cover a 6% area and then um, uh, how much it would cost at the end of the, the six to 12 weeks. So just to be clear, it's, it's an interesting intervention and I'm very happy we have something new in our armamentarium, but I'm not happy at how much this costs. Now we're on to something much simpler, and uh, um, this is kind of one of these gospel things about um, medicine that uh, I, I think you're probably like me, that when you learned about iron therapy, one of the things you learned was if you want iron to work and get absorbed better, uh, you can give it with a glass of orange juice or vitamin C. So believe it or not, despite that being a truth that we were educated about, we don't have high quality research on that. So this really addressed that, and that's why I think it's such a simple question, but it's so important. This was 440 patients who were truly anemic. Many times they're just low ferritins, that kind of thing. So this was a real anemic population. 88 was their hemoglobin. Mean age 39, 97% female. The main reason they were anemic was reported as uh, uterine abnormalities. Um, and if you digged, it looked like they were diagnosed with things like fibroids, stuff like that. And uh, they were given uh, ferrous succinate at 100 milligrams with vitamin C three times a day versus just the iron, the 100 milligrams of ferrous succinate alone, again, TID. It was unblinded, so take that for what it's worth. Um, normally that matters, the unblinding matters most when it's an outcome that the patient re could report or even uh, clinicians could report. But in this case, um, these are all lab numbers, so probably less important. Outcomes at eight weeks, there was no differences, and really no differences in anything. So I'm just going to give you some examples. Hemoglobin improved to 130 on vitamin C and 129 without, so that's not a meaningful difference at all. Uh, ferritin increased from six in both groups to 42 and 41. Again, not a meaningful difference in any way and certainly nothing statistical. There was no difference in adverse events, no difference in any other um, anemia parameters like MCV or anything you could look at. And they looked at two weeks, four weeks, six weeks and eight weeks. I gave you the eight week numbers, but the other numbers for the other time points were exactly the same. Nothing was statistically different in any. And this number of patients, these numbers and how close they are they really reassure us that I don't think we need more research in this area. This is this was a common question, but it's now answered. Um, the addition of vitamin C is not required to change iron absorption for anemic patients. I think this is a bit of a practice changer. Um, it's a bit of what's new and it's a bit of what's poo, because what we were told was not helpful. And this really reassures us that we don't need to worry about the vitamin C part. 
This is another interesting topic that we see a lot in medicine, but we had no research. I'm going to show you that the numbers in this study were small, and this was published in New England Journal. And it's an example of when we have a common problem that we're not getting answers for. Um, so this was uh, patients who have swollen legs and develop recurrent cellulitis. What would compression stockings do? If you're like me, you try and push patients to wear compression stockings, but they really don't like them. And uh, even though we were quite confident they were going to help, patients were reluctant. So this was uh, 84 patients were given compression stockings plus education or just the education alone. So that would be about 42 per group. The mean age was 64, 71% were male. Obesity was a common issue for these patients and probably contributed meaningfully to their um, swollen legs. The causes of swollen legs were all across the board from lymphedema to you name it. And uh, they got below knee stockings and the stockings were generally class um, two or three. Um, Cause I know that's gonna be a question you, you wanted to, to ask. Um, so at six months, uh, cellulitis was 15% compression versus 40% for the control group. That's a number needed to treat a four. The hazard ratio was 0.23 there. And the reason I mentioned that is it's not really important when you know the absolute numbers, but this hazard ratio is incredibly low. So even if you're a real EBM nerd and you say to yourself, well, what are the, you know, you can't blind for wearing a stocking and not wearing a stocking. You're absolutely right, you can't blind for that. So what is the absolute worst case scenario how much this would change? Well, it wouldn't change the hazard ratio enough. It would increase that hazard ratio to 0.4 and that's not enough to make any difference to the results here or any meaningful difference. This works, the unblinding doesn't likely matter here and um, I'm quite sure of that. And this is a dramatic difference um, because the results are so large um, in difference, the, blinding has little. It reduced leg volume by about 240 and it increased quality of life eight points. I'm going to show you quality of life data in another study, but be reassured, quality of life changes with interventions are generally only two to three. To see quality of life improvement of eight, that's something that's actually clinically meaningful. So just wearing the stockings makes people feel better about their quality of life. So even apart from the cellulitis, this was an important finding. Um, so really compression stockings reduce leg volumes, improve quality of life and reduce cellulitis um, episodes. Number needed to treat a four um, over six months. That's very impressive. Okay, Albert Einstein, you probably recognize him, but he has one of my favorite quotes and it speaks to a problem in research right now. And so we're gonna, we're gonna get to that. But his quote is, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So what research? might I be talking about where we keep researching it and we're getting the same answer all the time, but it's not making us happy. So we keep researching it because the belief system around it is so strong and that's vitamin D. I'm going to show you a whole cascade of different vitamin D studies. And I'll even mention one more that that's come out that I didn't I'll write down here. The first question is, does prenatal vitamin D prevent asthma in kids? So one of the two parents of these kids has HP. So um, eczema, uh, asthma, allergies. So they're at high risk for asthma. And from 10 to 18 weeks of delivery, moms were given um, an increased amount of vitamin D to 4,400 units instead of the 400 that was in their prenatal vitamin. And they followed these kids for six years after they were born, six years. And there was no difference in any of the asthma outcomes. So it doesn't work. What about preventing vitamin, what about using vitamin D to prevent asthma exacerbation in kids with asthma and lower vitamin D levels below 75? I would say that's not low, um, but, uh, and the Institute of Medicine would remind us it's not low either, but it's still what has been uh, reported as insufficient. Um, I don't think that's true, but that's one of the cutoffs we use. So um, these kids were 192 kids given 4,000 international units of vitamin D. And again, it made no difference over a year of asthma exacerbations. What about preventing TB in kids? You might think, well, where does this come from? Well, there's a lot of talk about, as you know, with COVID that it can work for infective uh, infectious disease, particularly respiratory infectious disease. So we just need to give and Why Mongolia? Why kids? Well, it's because the the study that found the largest effect 
of vitamin D pre for preventing respiratory infections was in children from Mongolia. The reason? they have incredibly low vitamin D levels. Their vitamin D level, uh, the average one in this study was 30 for these 8,000 kids. So the idea was they're the best candidates for getting more. They were given 14,000 international units and their vitamin D went all the way up to 75 uh, on average. And after um, a year or sorry, three years, there was no difference in the prevention of TB. What's even more important is they proved that there was also no difference in um, respiratory attack infections of any kind. So that was a, the first study was obviously um, spurious. It found a, a result by fluke because they repeated it. They originally had somewhere around 100 people. They repeated it with 8,800 and they found no effect. Does vitamin D prevent depression in older adults age uh, 67? They followed 18,000 people getting vitamin D 2,000 per day and for five years and it had no effect. This is the only one that I'll report to you that had that found an effect um, and it was by far the worst study. They had uh, differential follow-up. In other words, 22% of the treatment group was lost to follow-up versus uh, only 8% in the non. This was over a year. It took patients with uh, BPV vertigo and um, anyone that had a low vitamin D in the treatment arm was given vitamin D and calcium. Uh, twice a day, and um, you can see it was around a thousand patients. At the end of a year, 38% had a recurrence of BPV versus 47. This was an unblinded result, and the difference here, because the difference is smaller, it might actually be affected by um, non-blinding. It was affected by the poor follow-up um, in the treatment arm. To lose 22% versus eight is very suspicious. Um, and lastly, the thing they were using, they even acknowledged that the thing they were using to monitor BPV has never been validated. So the weakest study by far, but the one that found something. The last one I'll mention to you is a vitamin D study of preventing falls in the frail elderly, and they tried four different doses, 200, um, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000. And what they found was 1,000 was no better than 200. And the 2,000 and 4,000 may have actually be increasing bad events. Like there was statistically increase in hospitalizations due to higher doses um, uh, of vitamin D. And that, that's not the first time that's been found actually in um, giving them to uh, older adults that high levels do seem to increase falls uh, when you're giving high amounts. So the last one that I'll review is a fascinating one. This actually looked at you know, the stress from having multiple earthquakes, can vitamin D prevent that? And the reason that it, this is a, a question is, they say in this article, vitamin D is seen as a panacea. So could it actually be preventing um, distress? And these, this is a true distressful event. So there was, um, uh, in 2010, there was a large earthquake, um, 6.7, I think on the Richter scale and uh, knocked down some buildings. And then they had 3,000 aftershocks. And one of those aftershocks was even more serious and knocked down more buildings and actually resulted in a number of fatalities. So this was a distressful number of years for um, the people um, of Christchurch, New Zealand. And they were getting whopping doses of vitamin D every month. And the result is, is that it had no effect on the level of distress. And the reason that this one's of a particular interest to me, the last one is, I was there when that earthquake happened. Um, I was down there doing a talk at Christchurch and the um, building I was in uh, was shaking and the shaking got so bad that I remember you couldn't walk even holding the wall. I had to get on all fours to try and head to a safer area in the, in the room itself. It, it was a, um, a terrible event. So interesting question of could it actually help with um, preventing distress? All right, now it's time for us to talk about, after that kind of scary moment, it's time for us to talk about silly research. And we're only gonna interrupt the process with uh, talking about one at this time. So do parachutes prevent death or major trauma from jumping from an aircraft? So why would anyone even think about this? Well, this, was in a, this, this arose because years ago, a number of years ago, I think 20 years ago, someone wrote an editorial who was very frustrated with the concept of evidence-based medicine and suggested that all of those who believe in medicine, uh, evidence-based medicine should get in a large plane, fly up into the air, and half of them throw themselves out without um, 
parachutes and the other half with parachutes. And that would be a randomized control trial. Now, what that ignores is one of the tenets of evidence-based medicine is you don't need a randomized trial for all or nothing events. So um, we have research on people who've fallen out of planes and they don't do well, and those who wear parachutes do much better. So we didn't need an RCT of that. But this person took it a step further and decided to do a randomized control trial of jumping from an aircraft. And they recruited 23 people. And they were randomized to parachute or an empty backpack. This was in um, done in Michigan and Massachusetts. And um, they were eight, mean age 38, just over half were men. There was no blinding or allocation concealment. The investigators actually saw the randomization list, which is a no-no. Um, but I don't know that that affected the outcomes because there was no difference in death or major trauma. There was no difference in severity score. The quality of life scores were virtually identical. And you have to read this whole article to get right near the end before they give you a hint of what actually happened, because you're probably scratching your head at how you can jump from an aircraft without a parachute or an empty bat or just with an empty backpack? And the answer is <laughs> the aircraft was on the ground, of course. And this shows one of the people in the randomized control trial taking their death-defying jump um, in this picture. So it's a very um, kind of fun little study uh, that uh, they only jumped two feet down, but um, it did get published in the BMJ in 2018. I think it's worth mentioning, it's pretty funny. So we're halfway there. Never look at your beer as half empty, look at it as halfway to your next beer. <laughs> That's some positive thinking um, for you as we head in because we have two um, new studies that are relevant uh, for alcohol use. So this is gabapentin for alcohol use disorder. And as you know, um, when I went through training uh, 20 something years ago, it wasn't, um, there was really nothing we did for alcohol use disorder as far as a prescription medicine. There was talk of anti-abuse and, and that kind of thing. That, that intervention, but um, the, really now we're actually getting somewhere with this. So this is the this is the biggest RCT that I'm aware of. It took um, 90 heavy drinkers, and we'll get to what heavy drinking means, and it may kind of floor you a bit. So uh, this is uh, five days a week of heavy drinking minimum for 90 days, and then abstinent for three days um, or more. And they were given gabapentin on the first day, 300 milligrams at night, and a second pill and a third pill added as every day progressed. And by four days, they were on 300 at breakfast and lunch and 600 HS. The other arm got placebo and they were followed for 16 weeks. Mean age was 50 and most were men. And drinks per day was 11 to 13. So most of you know that's the upper limit for weekly drinking for considered safe or safer weekly drinking or moderate drinking. So this is per day though. Now, they, they use this test, which I know you're gonna wanna institute in practice. I'm joking because it's really only used for research, but it is a fascinating little test because this diacylo carbohydrate deficiency transferrin to, it's used to confirm abstinence. So if you're greater than 1.7%, it means you've been drinking um, usually heavily. So they use this, I'm not suggesting any of us ever order it, but it's, it's used in this research study. And that's how, because many of the studies, we depend on them to be honest, but this is the way to back check that when they report. At 12 weeks, confirmed no heavy drinking in the whole study was 27% uh, for the gabapentin group versus 9%. And no drinking at all was 18% versus 4%. So you can see those are pretty good number needed to treat. I mean, if we can take something as serious as as alcohol use disorder at that kind of level and turn people into no drinking, even over three months, that's remarkable. Um, and even reduced heavy drinking. Now, what was found when they looked at some subgroups, so you have to take this with a grain of salt, but it is worthy to note. Um, and that is those with um, alcohol withdrawal scores that were lower, gabapentin didn't seem to work as well. But when your alcohol um, withdrawal syndrome scores were higher, um, uh, so when they have more symptoms of alcohol withdrawal, the no heavy drinking, the effect got even better. You can see no, no heavy drinking was 46% versus 13, number needed to treat of four, and no drinking at all was 41 versus four, number needed to treat of only three. Gabapentin did all the things you'd expect it to do. It caused an increase in dizziness. They reported more nervousness and more headaches, but less insomnia, which again, you'd expect. The scratch your head part of this is, there is substance use of gabapentin, but I suspect it's um, 
I suspect it's probably less than the alcohol use disorder, although the authors did not examine that and it is kind of poorly examined in most of these studies. Are we trading one for the other? I, I think it's, I don't think that's as much of an issue, but it probably does occur for some patients. Gabapentin can prevent return to drinking um, for alcohol use disorder patients, particularly likely those with uh, more withdrawal symptoms. The next alcohol study was about AFib and there's cohort research observational studies saying, yeah, it might actually um, worsen AFib. So this was a really interesting open label RCT um, of 140 men, uh, mainly men, age 62, who were regular alcohol users. So they're slightly over the, the limit of what we would consider the upper amount for tolerance, which is about 12 per day for men. And uh, they had AFib, generally paroxysmal, because you had to have sinus rhythm when you entered this study. And uh, they had to have AFib for, or they had it for on average six years. Um, it was done in Australia. Um, as well. So randomized to abstain from alcohol um, versus getting no advice about drinking. And we'll get to one of the key features here, but I think the results are still relevant. So after six months, mean alcohol intake decreased to two in the no drinking arm uh, versus 13 and 61% in the no drinking arm completely abstained, 61%, so almost two thirds. AFib recurrence happened in 53% in the no drinking arm versus 73% in the where they got no advice, the control arm. That difference is 20% in the number needed to treat a five. Getting admitted um, for AFib, that was 9% versus 20, so a number needed to treat of nine and an 11% reduction. The key limit to this is exactly what you'd expect. You're taking people who drink quite a bit every day and you're telling them to stop. Um, they didn't, 70% uh, refused to participate mainly um, because they didn't want to give up drinking. So really this applies in your practice to about one third of patients who you see who drink a fair amount and have paroxysmal AFib because two thirds will tell you they don't, they can't really stop or don't want to stop. Um, and that may be the time to discuss alcohol use disorder, et cetera, and maybe refer to the last one. But uh, regardless, recognize that you'll have trouble with a number. But of those who do, recognize that a lot will heed your advice. And um, if that, that one third, a lot will heed your advice and two thirds of them will, of that one third will entirely stop. So that means about 20%. That's still pretty good for a problem like this. 50% of regular drinkers with paroxysmal AFib who quit drinking will uh, have a recurrence compared to 70% who continue drinking. That's a big reduction. And if you abstain um, for six months, or if you're a group that's trying to abstain or reduce your drinking, um, you'll have a reduction of about 11% in your hospital admissions. Um, so that's another very important number, very impressive actually, because it's only six months, right? And that's a big reduction. Moving on to um, things outside of alcohol and alcohol use disorder. So empagliflozin for systolic heart failure. There's, there's not much new here. These are these SLGT2s. They're trying to find another market, um, which is reasonable if they can. And um, uh, some of the studies have already shown they work, but the question remained, did EMPA also have this effect of the gliflozins? So this was almost 4,000 patients, 3,700 or so in systolic heart failure. Um, they were given empagliflozin 10 milligrams once a day, even in diabetes, 10 and 25 the effect is pretty much the same. Um, so mean age was 67, 76% um, uh, were men, 50% uh, were diabetic. So this wasn't because of diabetes. And 75% uh, had class two, the rest had class three. And their ejection fraction was on average 27 and their GFR was around 62. So kind of classic heart failure patients that you might think of. So after 16 months, hospitalization for heart failure and um, cardiovascular disease was, um, and cardiovascular death rather, was 19% versus 25. The difference is the, the um, cardiovascular disease death didn't reach statistical significance on its own. And most of this result was from the reduction in heart failure admission, which is true of many of these studies. It's not that it's not working for cardiovascular death, it's just you need bigger numbers. You need to either have a bigger study or you need to go longer to find that, uh, especially in class when it's mostly class two. Um, so death, um, so the number needed to treat there would be 19. 
You can see here, this is back to the normal kind of differences in quality of life. It's six versus four, so that's two difference. It's probably not meaningful. GFR decline was barely any difference of um, basically 1.7% or 1.7 different. Systolic was even less at 0.7 difference. So most of these things don't matter. So when you hear all this talk about these surrogate markers, you can ignore most of that. What really matters is the reduction in heart failure hospitalization. Genital infections were slightly up as you might um, expect. So it does work for hospitalization for heart failure and you don't have to be diabetic for that benefit. Lots of talk about opioid use disorder now, as you know. And one of the things is uh, we know that many of the deaths that are occurring are not due to prescription opioids that plays a role for sure. And for some patients, it's the start. But that brings us to the question of does our prescriptions, what is the risk of needing or using opioids prolonged after um, you start a prescription? So this one, they tried to look at musculoskeletal um, injuries that led to a short-term prescription or a prescription of opioids. And so this was a huge, this is cohort data, so it should be big numbers. This is 13 million patients, mostly from the U.S. They were followed for three to 24 months, mostly for a year, so you can look at that as your outcome. They were various MSK injuries, so it could be shoulder, arm, hip, knee, whatever, fractures, etc. And there were some studies where they mixed in other patients with abdominal pain, but mostly what you're seeing here is MSK injuries. Prolonged was defined different in most of the 13 studies. So some used you needed six or more scripts after the first month. Some needed you needed one script after 90 days. Other ones said you needed four over the year. It varied, but, but it was generally you were getting more scripts uh, for longer. What is the risk? Well, in the general population, it's around 6%. And in higher risk groups, which interestingly include veterans um, in there, in the US uh, veterans group, but um, workman's comp patients and those with a, a history of substance use disorder, they, they go up to 27% will still be using opioids, so about one in four. What are the risk factors? Past substance use disorder, as you might expect, and then longer scripts and higher doses which is really the big take home point for us. I think all of us knew that people with substance use disorder are more, it's more concerning prescribing in them. But just a reminder that our scripts are often too long and too many pills given and too, and too high doses. And so for most patients, it's around a 6% risk. And uh, we did a tools for practice on this back in 2019. And we look specifically more at what's your risk of opioid use disorder. If you look at all comers, including those with substance use disorder, it goes up to as high as 3% of, of uh, leading to an opioid use disorder with a, after an opioid script. But if you look at those, when you exclude those who have a, a history of, of substance use disorder of any type, it goes down to 1% or less. Risk factors are still the same, longer scripts, higher doses. So just remember that we need to be giving a lot less um, of uh, opioids when people get short injuries. We need to keep them short, uh, 10, 15 pills um, tops. They can call in for uh, and, and call in for refills or talk to us about that and um, lower doses, lower potencies, that kind of thing. This study wasn't actually done in 2020, but it won an award in 2020. So we thought that we would include it here because it is one of these kind of really enlightening studies. There was one previous study that did not find an effect. And the question is, if a woman has a vaginal operative delivery, so with forceps or vacuum, would she benefit from uh, a single dose of antibiotics around the time of the delivery? It was up to, um, at the time of delivery or six months, or sorry, six months, six hours. <laughs> There's a subtle difference there. Six hours afterwards. And uh, it was a mox clab at one gram of a mox. And they were no third or fourth degree cares because they were going to get antibiotics anyway. They included people with premature rupture of, of membranes who got antibiotics. Um, and um, prime MIPS were the majority of patients here, and about half needed to be induced. So at six weeks, you can see what you'll see here is the results, almost any result that would be relevant, reduced by around 10%, sometimes a little less, but around a 10% reduction. So maternal infections was 11% versus 
Um, perineal pain was 46% versus 55. Wound breakdown was 11 versus 21. Primary care visits for the perineum and follow-up afterwards uh, was 28% versus 38%. And it ended up costing less on average by about 50 pounds or 200, or sorry, $100 um, less per patient. So really this was, the reason I think it won the award is that it, the previous study was very small. This really attempted to answer the question by using, it had a great design, um, good, um, uh, like really good with allocation concealment, blinding, et cetera. And so for the evidence nerds, that was important, but it uh, also used a big number of patients, was kind of very pragmatic in design and found consistency across the board. So one dose of, of antibiotics after um, an operative delivery can be helpful to reduce um, outcomes. This one, BMJ's 2020 research paper of the year. Okay, we're coming to the end, and this is um, this is the uh, simplified lipid guideline. Um, it's used by a lot of you, and I, I think that's great. Um, and you can see we have both primary and secondary prevention on here. And I bring it up because when we created this and we started the process of making, trying to make things simplified and actually naming them simplified, we were accused by some people of things like, why do you make things, why are you calling them simple? Is it because you people who use this, it's uh, can't take something that, or can't follow something that's complicated, etc. So no, it's about helping people do things in practice because our practices are busy. So how do we simplify things down to the most important pieces in our practice? So um, that we were told, can't they handle complex medicine? So I'm going to show you now as time has turned, it's been six years and it's very common for other guideline groups to now use words like simple and that kind of thing. So this is from the 2018 cholesterol guidelines from the American College of Cardiology and they call their guidelines, their, and these are the summary guidelines, guidelines made simple. I wanna show you what they mean by simplified. <laughs> That's just for primary and this is for secondary. <laughs> so my colleagues, some of my colleagues said to me, man, they're gonna start to replace us doing simple guidelines. I don't, I'm not too worried about it when I look at this. Um, I don't think they're hitting the mark on simplified. This is a guideline. I worry about our guideline though, because it is now six years old and we won't get to doing it and we won't start um, updating it until the end of this year. So I think it's relevant to look at other guidelines being published in 2020 that might, um, that might speak to how far out of date the 2015 simplified guidelines are. These guys say do lipids every 10 years. We said every five years, so they're actually spreading that out. And they said calculate risk every two to five years. So that was very similar, we said every five years. Uh, continue to treat to target doses, don't treat to LDL levels. That's the same as the simplified guideline. Um, do not use additional tests to redefine risks like CRP and APO lipoprotein, any of those. You don't need them, you just need to know what people's risk is. Um, and simplified calculators like the BS Medicine calculator or any of the general Framingham ones will do fine. Um, and, and other calculators, whatever one you're using, it's almost certainly the right one. So be reassured. For primary prevention, just use a moderate dose statin if a patient chooses to be on a statin um, after you discuss risks and benefits. And don't use PCSK9s or Icosopent or any of those new drugs. For secondary prevention, start still with a moderate dose statin. If you want to help them out more, try and get that to high dose, the effect would be small. Um, so what's, what's a moderate, a moderate potency would be, um, something like a torvastatin 10 milligrams, uh, 10 to 20, uh, would be moderate potency in dose. Okay. Um, and then step up intensification for higher risk patients, depending on what they can tolerate and, and what their risks you think are. Lab testing, there's no need for fasting for doing lipids and you don't need to monitor once you start statins, um, because you've already done the major thing that's going to affect things for them that's going to reduce their events for physical activity they say um, everyone should be doing exercise that's again what we said in the, the simplified guideline and they said uh, people should eat the mediterranean diet for diet and they said avoid supplements they mean omega-3s and of and niacin integrates so interesting very very little difference after five years um, 
So reassuring, we're still going to do our update uh, start it this year, but it's important to or we're still planning to anyway. And um, but it's important to know how things have changed. OK, silly research really quickly here. This was a database that took speeding and compared it to physician databases. And they look specifically at those who drive over 20 miles um, per hour over the speed limit. And I want you to just stop and think, who do you think of specialists and us, family docs, as uh, we're specialists too, but our, our colleagues of the subgroups of, of specialties, who is speeding the most? And I'll show you quite quickly. Surgical subspecialties are the one that I thought would speed the most. They're speeding the least and it's psychiatrists and where do family physicians speed kind of towards the, the bottom. We all do it, as you know. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's just a, it is true that we, we all speed a bit. So who does it slightly more? And then this is looking at luxury cars and where do family doctors fit, <laughs> they fit right at the, the bottom and cardiologists are most likely to drive luxury vehicles and we're the least likely. Um, but this is an important question. Who's, you know, what family, what, what, sorry, what uh, physicians are driving luxury vehicles? This is an example of the luxury vehicles, but I'm just letting you know that they're not the only people who actually study that. It's ridiculous to me that this would be considered an important question to anyone, but it's actually been looked at by two different groups. This is the second group. And you can see if you're looking at the more expensive cars, um, our specialist colleagues are more likely to be driving those. No surprise, and we're more likely to be driving Toyotas, Hondas, um, and that kind of thing. So um, if you're driving an Audi, you might want to switch uh, specialties. I'm kidding, of course. Here's our last one, and the last one is the absolute most silliest, but it is science, so I wanted to give it. Can frozen fecal knives be used for survival? Yes, that is that is the research question. You might want to read that again, because you can't believe it, but it is truly the question they asked and the reason that they asked it or they claim they asked it is because there are two fables or stories one is of an inuit man who fashions a knife when his knife was taken from them uh, and he fashioned a knife out of feces and used it to cut himself free slay an animal all sorts of things to survive um, and the next story is of a danish man who used his frozen feces as a chisel to get out of being trapped in hard snow now I have to confess I have a bias here because um, my wife is both part Inuit and part Danish. So this might affect why I chose this study um, as well. So please take into account that, <laughs> that Inuit Danish bias that I, I may have due to, due to my wife. Okay, so <laughs> I love the writing in this. This is a direct quote, to procure the necessary raw materials for knife production. I think we know what they're talking about. They used, one was made out of molds and one was again, sadly named hand shaped. So that, um, it's exactly what that sounds like straight out. They gave you the diets of the people who were, um, as they say, procuring the necessary raw materials. One guy, the person, or one person, the first person was um, trying to eat a higher protein like an Inuit person might eat. So I just wanted to circle, they did break the rules sometimes. A butternut squash risotto is probably not a traditional Inuit diet. And the other person had a cheeseburger and onion rings, which again, I don't know who would have had that. But one of the funny things about this is it received ethics approval from Kent University. So now this study actually had photographs, as crazy as that seems. And I wanna show you the first photograph that I saw and was saying to myself, oh goodness, that's not what I think it is. I hope it's not what I think it is, this photo. And I was like, is that, what this is is clay for making the molds and that's an archaic knife that they wanted to use to make the molds. So neither of that is what you thought it might be. Now this is what you think it might be and they're filing it down. And I think Kent University is, um, selling that uh, on the buy and trade that file if you're looking for one. <laughs> um, and everything, all of the fables were in snow, so they're they're doing things uh, cold. And then they took them and they tried to cut um, flesh with them. And it turns out that when you wipe feces across a substance, it leaves streaks. That was one of the findings <laughs> of this very important research study. Um, yeah. <laughs> Like, again, you cannot make this up. This is 
This is science. Um, no matter what you hear or think, feces has very few household uses. Um, it can be used as fertilizer. Um, it's called uh, night soil um, in some cultures, but really that's, I think, where it pretty much ends. Okay, I did want to go through quickly the other studies, or so the other talks coming up. Nick Dugray is going to do this version of this talk in French. He's going to use some different studies. Nick is a member of the peer group and, and a brilliant guy, quite funny. So um, I do think about tuning in if you're fortunate enough to be bilingual. Um, and, or if you're, if you can pass that on to any of your French speaking colleagues. And um, the next one is going to be on heart failure after that on May 18th. And that's from our partners at uh, our X-Files are going to talk about uh, reduced injection fractions and how do we, with this massive cascade of drugs now that we have in our armamentarium, how do you balance those out? And the last is interventions for weight loss. And I mentioned this was coming. This is from our expert evidence expert team uh, who are also clinicians at the CFPC. And they're going to talk about all sorts of things from diets to exercise to medications for weight loss because it's such a topical area. Why am I dressed like Steve Jobs today? Because I'm trying to sell something electric. <laughs> um, so this is CFPC Learn. We have a, a new website for you, and it's all about learning. This talk will be on there and be certified. We have tools for practice on there, videos, podcasts. The BS Medicine podcast will be on there very soon. Um, and we have learning. We have programs, uh, sorry, like uh, um, we call them instructional design, but they're uh, workshops kind of thing that you can go through. So lots and lots of options uh, for you to get credits and you can do that at any time and they're entered automatically for you so um, hopefully you'll check that out because um, we think that it provides a lot of value for dollar all right thank you i'm going to stop sharing and try and answer some of our um, questions so the first question is, any benefit from high dose vitamin D in ICU patients? So the last time I looked at this, I did not see that that was effective. So I would have to look specifically at that. But there, there was a study, for example, of high dose vitamin C for, and it got lots and lots of press, tons of press, but it would be firmly in the poo category. Because when you looked at it, there were multiple outcomes, none were positive, And uh, one of the secondary outcomes out of many was positive, and that was the one that was being picked up on social media and talked about ad nauseum um, in this tiny study. So, which is just spurious because don't forget, once you've done ten, once you've done ten statistical tests, your chance of finding something by accident alone is fifty percent. Just fifty, and once you go up to twenty statistical tests, it it gets much closer to hundred percent. So these are this is nothing more than reporting fluke. As far as vitamin D, the last time I looked for ICU patients, there was no benefit. Um, new studies about vitamin D and reducing the incidence of cold and pneumonia. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know of anything published recently. What you will find is studies published that are cohort or observational studies, and they will draw a clear link between vitamin D and your risk of developing colds, pneumonias, heart disease, cancers, you name it, including probably hair loss, which clearly I suffer from low vitamin D. Um, but what, what these are, are surrogate markers, of course, and causation and correlation are not the same thing. The fact that ice cream consumption goes up at the same time shark attacks go up does not mean that um, shark attack, ice cream is causing shark attacks. They just happen to both go up in the summer. Um, so this, these correlation statistics are very deceiving. So what you have to do is look at randomized trials. The last big meta-analysis of respiratory tract infections published in the BMJ was in 2018. It was before this 8,800 person study that I pointed out to you. It found an odds ratio of 0.88. So you might think, well, that's a reduction. It's about a 12% reduction. The trouble is an odds ratio used for common events and the name common cold means it's common. <laughs> so using an odds ratio in there twists the actual statistics. So if you converted that to the more appropriate relative risk, the reduction was 4% and no longer statistically or clinically meaningful. However, if you then further dissect these studies, they were all across the board. And um, many of them, the, one of the biggest drivers was the one I mentioned to you. I think it was by Charmaine or something like that in Mongolia. And we we just proved that the result of that was spurious. If you look at studies done of vitamin D in 
um, the developed world. So there was a great one done in New Zealand. Um, it had 600 and something patients in it. Um, and they were university workers and healthcare workers. And what they found was absolutely no effect after two years on respiratory infections. So this is kind of the consistent finding. We want to find something here. We find them, if we find results that are positive, they're in small studies, which is very common because um, you get a selective publication of small studies with positive effects. Um, authors who find nothing in their small studies often don't publish. So I am very um, uh, tentative about any of these kind of things. I think we've got, we've have so many studies, so many people now showing vitamin D. I think it's one of my biggest beefs about all this is that we're wasting money on vitamin D. We, we need to figure out so many clinical questions and yet millions and hundreds of million dollars is being poured into vitamin D based on theory. Um, and it's, it's not panning out consistently, but we're not happy with that message. So we keep doing more research. Vitamin D and COVID. Yeah. So there's a tools for practice on this. Again, people are focusing on the smaller study that found a positive benefit um, and not looking at the other studies that don't find a benefit. The general assumption for most people who follow the literature on this is that it's unlikely vitamin D provides any benefit in COVID. Um, and there's other studies, uh, like I said, of respiratory tract infections that likely it doesn't um, find or pretty consistently doesn't find any benefit. Um, one of the problems here is what, what is vitamin D and or what is the right level of vitamin D? And you have to understand that we've likely been led astray by that. Um, one of the groups that promoted uh, high levels of vitamin D was the Vitamin D Society. And they based what we should have as vitamin D levels on what people without clothes would get if they were, and they were pale skinned and living in the Sahara uh, in the open sun all day. And so they based it on what our vitamin D levels would be like that, not reasonably what, what actually affects health outcomes. The Institute of Medicine did that work and they found that really you're not at risk until you're less than 50 and you're not really at risk until you're even less than that, like 35 or 30. But you have a chance of being at risk if you're less than 50. So. The whole thing about insufficiency at 75 is probably we've just, it's a it's the wrong target for a surrogate marker, which is certainly not the first time we've seen that um, and how forces outside of evidence influence these, these cut points. Um, what about for diabetic diabetics? Are you recommending annual lipid checks? Uh, no. Why don't I recommend that? Because lipids have a high variance in testing and they change so little per year. The average rate of change of a lipid level per year, if you're looking at something like total cholesterol, is one to 3%, 3% being the most. The average variability, average variability, in even the lowest studies is 7%, ranging up to 12%. So if something is changing this amount, and the measurement variability is this amount, you can't pick up that change. When you're finding changes, you're actually finding spurious results. So if someone goes from a five and a half down to a 5.2, that's just random chance in testing. And these tests, when they're drawing blood on these people for these studies of variants, they're drawing them sometimes in the same day. Um, you know, the studies of this kind of thing, take bone mineral density, for example. Bone mineral density has a minimum of a 5% variance, but changes only about 1% per year. No studies were done with in one study. What they had them do is walk out of the machine, walk once around the machine, and then sit back down and get it done again. And they still had a 5% variance. Variance is a serious problem in measurement. And our enthusiasm to measure should reflect that variance and the amount that things actually change. In fact, the change from uh, once you're on a moderately high dose of statins to, to tweak it up even more. So let's say you had a patient on 20 milligrams of atorvastatin and you change them to 40. The drop in their cholesterol will only be about 5 to 7%, which is similar to variance. So it's actually hard to pick up. And you shouldn't feel, if you, if you are inclined to be one of the people who does that, you shouldn't look at those numbers and go, oh, it didn't work. That's probably working. You need to do about 20 measurements before and 20 measurements after that if you really, really care about that. Know that the research says that for people at very high risk, those with a past MI, that they'll get another 1% to 2% benefit over about three years um, by getting them to, from a moderate to a high dose. So 
that that is happening no matter what the measurement readings because people with higher cholesterol levels people with lower cholesterol levels when you give them statins they both benefit um, there's been lots of studies where they enrolled people with low cholesterols um, but with other risk factors and they they did um, just fine so uh, they got the same benefit about a 30 percent relative reduction or a, you know a, a two to three percent absolute reduction over a short time and and higher over longer times okay i think that's the end of our questions and we're slightly over time i really appreciate that don't forget to do your questionnaire so you can um, the survey so that you can get your credits uh, stay tuned for those uh, talks coming down the pipeline from um, practical talks for family docs and also please check out cfpc learn i mean i wore my steve jobs uniform for a reason <laughs> anyway thanks a lot and we'll talk to you later mm -hmm.